May we have your attention, please? You're listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton. We hear voices all the time. Many of them are completely anonymous. We don't need to know their names, but we need to hear what they're saying because if we can't hear them, we might miss our train or take a wrong turning in the car. In most cases, the people behind those voices are real. And with every real person comes a real life story. You can hear me on the London Underground. The next train to arrive alongside Platform 2 will be an Edgware Road service. And my husband Phil makes that iconic announcement that everyone knows. Mind the gap. Sadly, Phil died a few years ago. But since his death, we've still worked together every single day, announcing trains in tube tunnels. Our story was told in episode one, but in Tales from the Tannoy, I plan to tell the stories and the major highs and lows behind all the anonymous voices we hear all the time. Some voices aren't entirely anonymous because their names are occasionally spoken, especially voices reading the news on the radio, but we never really get to hear anything about them because they're busy imparting the news of other people's lives, and that's what we usually tune in for. But there must be more to these people than a clear, engaging voice. Mike Cooper was heard here. You're listening to the BBC World Service. I'm Mike Cooper, and this is from our own correspondent. And he also crops up a lot narrating documentaries on the History Channel. He sounds like the archetypal Englishman. Intelligent, engaging, perhaps with 2.4 children, a Volvo and a Labrador. Or maybe not. Mike, you started in the black country and have ended up in North Carolina, and it's fair to say that there have been a few ups and downs on your journey. But where was that voice of yours first heard on air? I'd started in local radio, um, which was always really what I wanted to do. Um, I, I grew up listening to those voices on, on the TV and on the radio, and, and I just kind of thought, I want to be one of them. Right. And it was always the voices between the stuff that really interested me. So I always thought, yes, that's what I want to do. And I didn't come from a family that had any kind of media background or acting background or anything. And I think my parents, for a long time, really thought it was just a pipe dream and kept on at me to knuckle down at school and get good grades so that I could go on and do something sensible. So I I ended up in local radio and I had a couple of good years at it. And then I got fired. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) All the best people have been fired from radio. Classic radio thing, you know, said said the wrong thing, uh, overstepped the mark. And um, that was the end of that. So What did uh, you say? Can you remember? uh, It was around that time where, uh, do you remember when premium rate phone lines first came out? And yes, this I was, used to work on one. This was the day. I was at school. Yes, I'm sure you did. <laughs> uh, Not even joking. This but was anyway. the days before the internet. So, um, yes. our sports department at the radio station had been calling this 089 whatever number to get the results because they were coming through on there quicker than they were getting them on the teleprompter. So they'd run up this huge bill. And I, at the time, I, I presented this uh, theoretically anarchic. Saturday morning show, um, and so I, I mentioned this on air in a in a, a wry, tongue in cheek way, which fell completely foul of the management. Oh. And on the Monday morning, I was summoned and told that my services were no longer required. So at the age of twenty, <laughs> my, my dream of of working in radio and in broadcasting came to an abrupt end. It was around the time that I was I was coming out as gay. So mm-hmm. there's this all of this stuff going on. I ended up going from from being a local radio presenter, sort of small time local celebrity, to uh, doing what I could. I ended up working in a gay bar. <laughs> Right. I'm not sure what my parents thought of this this sudden career change. No. Uh, and I ended up Bad working... Bad enough that you wanted to go into radio and then you ended up in a gay bar. Well, God, that, was, Mike. that was the thing, You've just yeah. been a liar. Uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> so I, I was doing that and then I ended up uh, picking up a job in a call centre. It really convinced me that I never wanted to work in an office or a call centre or anything like it ever again. And... Then somebody, my my friend Andy, um, said to me, "Oh, you know, so and so went for uh, went for an audition at Central Television to be an announcer and got turned down." So we had a little chuckle about that, and then I thought, "Well, I could do that." So suddenly, my my media career went off in a different direction, and I ended up being a TV announcer. And that then took me south, funnily enough, because I thought, "Well, I'm on a roll here." Um, why don't I try my hand and see if I can get some work at the at the BBC World Service as well? If there's been something that I've wanted to do 
I've usually gone for it and it's usually yeah. worked out. And I've been very fortunate in that regard. Uh, I, I, career-wise, there's been very little that's been absolutely off limits to me. And it's enabled me, fortunately, to reinvent myself a few times along the way and, and change course. So, yeah, at this point, I, I count myself as very fortunate um, that from a standing start and, and no kind of leg up or way in or anything like that, I, I seem to have built quite a nice varied career, which landed me in voiceover about 13, 14 years ago, finally. Yeah. And and how are your parents now? Were they, did they become proud of you in the end? They are now, yeah. I mean, it's... <laughs> it, it's it would be difficult. I mean, you know, they they now have a they now have a son who's been a BBC newsreader and and director and who now has um, at least on the face of it a successful voiceover career and um, yeah, they are proud of me. I think so. It's a good job um, you didn't become a teacher or a lawyer after all. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. But the one thing was my father was just determined that I wasn't going to follow in his footsteps because he was actually um, he worked in a factory. I mean, when he left school at I think fourteen. They really were just factory fodder. So although he became very good and very proficient and very skilled at what he did, he was um, he was an engineer. He was a centre lathe turner. He made parts for aircraft, um, but he hated it. For my parents' generation, it it certainly wasn't a given that work was something that you should enjoy or or even should have any right to expect to enjoy. No, no, I think you're right actually. So your parents were quite traditional um, and you said earlier that when you were at BBC Shropshire you were thinking about coming out. Um, presumably you did come out to them eventually, but, but were you worried about their reaction? I was terrified. Um, mm. Again, you know, my, my parents came from a very working class background. Uh, my father uh, working at a factory. You can imagine the, the, just the entrenched racism and homophobia. And back in those days... 70s, 80s, there weren't a lot of, I mean, there weren't any what I would call role models that I would want to aspire to on TV. I mean, the only people that you saw on TV that you thought might be gay were people like John Inman in, in Are You Being Served? He, do you know, he was, the, he was the second gay man I ever met. Really? Uh, as part of working for Radio WM, I had to go and collect him from the Grand Theatre in Wolverhampton where he was in panto because he was a famous pantomime dame. Yeah. And I remember I, I went to collect him and he had dark glasses and a long fur coat that, that <laughs> went to the pavement. Uh, and, I, and I walked him around and I, and I just, I, I don't know. I, it, was, it was one of those things that I looked at him and I thought, you, it, this terrifies me. This is absolutely not who I want to be. But I absolutely applaud that you are able to be what you want to be. And I think the combination of that and the first gay man that I ever met being Dale Winton at Beacon Radio. Oh, really? Um, who was just everything that you that you remember about Dale Winton was exactly how he was in real life. He was yes. larger than life. He used to carry a little man bag. He used to use the ladies <laughs> he used to use the ladies loo on the ground floor. Um, he called everybody pop it. Um, so I yeah. Love that. My 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 first two exposures to 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 meeting uh, like real life gay people was, was Dale Winton and John Inman. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it was great. But no, my, my parents did very, very well with it. I, I was terrified mm. to tell them. Uh, it turned out that they'd watched a program about about gay children and they'd, they'd had a preliminary conversation about, well, what would we do if Michael did this with us? And they'd agreed that they would love me regardless and they would do, them, do their best to support me. Wonderful. Um, so it actually worked out very well. For. And to be honest, I mean, I've, I've challenged them a few times over the years, um, you know, first with that and then with other stuff later. And they've always, they've always stepped up. They've always surprised me. Um, so, yeah, in, in that regard, they've always been very supportive. Yeah. Sound like wonderful parents. Yeah. So you say that there the, were the other challenges that you you presented to your parents and them <laughs> presented themselves to you. <laughs> Moving yeah. along, I'm trying to find a, a link to. <laughs> <laughs> you just go. You just go for that smooth segue there, aren't you? And it's it's never going to happen. Um, so that was. Should the I just come out with it? So the HIV <laughs> then, Mike. Yeah. So 2002, um, I, I'd come out of a relationship that really wasn't a great relationship. It was it was pretty toxic, and I think a few of my friends had seen the writing on the wall. Um, 
and it was it was it, it was just one of those relationships that was mixed up in so many different ways. Um, the first time that we'd met and got together mm. um, for reasons that I've never been quite sure of, um, other than just one of those things that you you make the wrong decision in the heat of the moment. Uh, we'd had unprotected sex, and mm. I'd never done that before. And it had always been a big thing for me. But there was something about this guy that that made me feel confident. And he didn't bring anything up. And I didn't bring anything up. And it wasn't until after we'd had sex, unprotected sex, uh, that a couple of weeks later, he told me that he was HIV positive. Wow. And so the, he knew? The, yeah, he knew. And my world just kind of faded away and I just didn't know what to do with this. And it, it, it all got very messy, but we did end up staying together and we stayed together for about 18 months, during which time things just got progressively worse. Mm. And if I finally decided this isn't going to work and, and I have to get out of this. Um, so... I, I, I broke it off. And one of my friends at the time was a, a, a sexual health doctor. Right. And he said, look, I really think we ought to go and get you tested. And he went with me and held my hand and took me to uh, the clinic. And I got my result and went in and, and did the blood test. I mean, uh, as gay men those of us who were being responsible at the time were already going and getting tested. So I, 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 before I'd been with with my partner, I'd been getting tested. I hadn't been getting tested while we were together because I thought I was taking the right precautions mm. and, and I'd put it off and, yeah, it, it yeah. was a big mess. Um, but, yeah, I went along and, and uh, came back for the result a few hours later and uh, the very nice nurse um, said, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Michael. And that was that. Mm. And so... And that must have been very scary, actually, leaving a relationship with somebody that you knew was HIV positive and then probably, you know, thinking to yourself, what, what, the likelihood is that I've got it too, um, but not getting tested, but then having to make a fresh start, knowing that you... Was that difficult? The was... weird thing for me was that the, during the time that we were together, I'd actually thought that I probably was reasonably safe because he'd get... He'd, I, I honestly believe that he believed all of this, mm. but he told me that he was a, a non-progressor and that he was unlikely to be able to infect me, and I didn't know anything, and I, I think I just ostriched a little bit. I, I yeah. stuck my head in the sand and didn't choose to go and find out the facts until later, and of course, by then, it was it was too late to do anything about it. Mm. Um but this was 2002, and, and the game changed in terms of, of HIV treatment around 1996. That was when the first combination therapies came in, where instead of, instead of giving people one drug and hoping for the best, they were hitting it with two or three different types of highly active therapy, uh, and that was really starting to change. So by the time... By the time I was diagnosed, it was already the case that it, it wasn't going to be a big problem to take care of, even mm. though it was still a huge thing to learn that you have this thing that could potentially be life-threatening. Yes. So, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, it was a wake-up call, and it made me think, well, it's kind of like being given a death sentence, but then somebody saying, oh, hang on, Mr. Cooper, we seem to have the wrong file. Um this one's yours and actually you're okay. So I'd, I'd had the wake-up call, um, but I, I, it turned out it was okay for me. And it was another seven years uh, before I ended up having to start taking treatment. Right. So I'd go along and get tested every three, six months. They would do all the numbers and, and make sure everything was within parameters. And then a weird thing happened. Hmm. And this was about 2009. And... I dropped something on my toe and right. a blood blister came up and the blood blister never really went away. It hardened and it was just this unsightly like black spot on mm. my middle toe of my, my right foot, I think it was. 
And in the end, I thought, well, that's unsightly. I'd kind of like to get that taken care of. So I called the GP and they said, oh, that's all right, we'll book you into the minor surgery clinic. And they took it off. And I thought no more about it. What I didn't know was that standard procedure for anybody who has a blood-related disease like HIV is that they sent it away for autopsy and checked it out. And I got a letter out of the blue a couple of weeks later that said um, that your blood sample has tested positive for Kaposi's sarcoma. Ooh. And that's one of the biggies, you know. That's if you remember the days of of the AIDS epidemic and the yeah. people with the like the the purple black the spots lesions, on there. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Kaposi's sarcoma. It's a, an opportunistic <laughs> infection. And although my numbers had still been in the right areas, um, this thing was now a reality. And I said, "Well, what should I do?" And they, the, the doctor, I, I, I'm so fortunate. I've had amazing. Amazing medical care mm. um, from from the people at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital over the years. I have the same doctor now that I've had for almost twenty years. Yeah. Uh, I've watched him go grey, go bald. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said, "Well, here's the thing." He said, "You might not get another one, or you might get another one, and it might come up right on the end of your nose. It's mm. really up to you, but this would be a good time to think about starting therapy." So I did. Yeah. Um, but I was still, at this point, I was I was still very, um, I hadn't told anybody very much apart from my close friends and my parents I'd told. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I still very much had a lid on it at that point. And I was still living with the stigma of it and allowing yeah. it to have far too much power over me, to be honest. Mm. Um and that changed. I, I, I kind of, I was coming around to the idea that I might want to be a little more open about it. Um, but it, it really changed when we did the, the magazine article. <laughs> and for those who haven't seen it, um, it is a fairly graphic interview with you and your partner about your sex life. Yeah. So my husband, by that point, Mark and I, had been approached by the people at QX magazine. They wanted to do an article about what we call serodiscordant couples. So right. couples where one partner is HIV positive and the other partner isn't. And they wanted to do an article that featured, I think it was a dozen couples, uh, all talking about their stories about how they how they handled the idea that they were living in a serodiscordant relationship. Mm. So we did this article and we had... It was it was a really polarised reaction because we had quite negative pushback from some people that we knew in the gay community really? um, who felt like we'd been far too, um, I don't know, um, not far too open, but they felt that we'd perhaps been too upfront about some of the things that, some of the decisions that gay men make that, that maybe don't point them in, paint them in the right light. Mm. Uh, whatever it was, there were, there was certainly some negative feedback from some people that we knew. Mm. But then on the other hand, I was going into the BBC, into Broadcasting House and going into the newsroom, and people who I barely knew or didn't even know were coming up to me and saying things like, this is a subject I didn't want to really know anything about um, and it was uncomfortable for me to read, but I'm so grateful that you've done it because I now have a much better understanding of this uh, yeah. and thank you for doing that. And that was the point where I thought, well, that's exactly what it was designed to do. And yeah. from that point, I, I took that decision at that, at that time that I would never make it a secret anymore. Anybody mm. can talk to me about this. Um, and although I don't, I don't broadcast it. It's you know, it's not on my website. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, man. <laughs> but I, I've always been totally open, and I've I've always appreciated. And it happened to me just recently. I had a friend, uh, a friend who I hadn't really spoken to in a few years, but because he knew that I was HIV positive, and because he knew that I was okay talking about it, he came to me and said look, I've got some questions and I'm not getting the help I want. Can I talk to you? And I, I really like being being able to be that for people. Yeah. Does it make a difference, do you think, that you were somebody that... I know that you weren't really in the public eye as a presenter, a news presenter on the television or whatever, but you were still somebody that had a, a career that you probably really wanted to protect. Um, so did that affect your decision in any way about whether you did the article or not, knowing that you were a name? It did a little bit. I mean, I was... 
slightly shielded from that because I wasn't... Um, I was broadcasting for the World Service, so I wasn't broadcasting domestically. Mm. So it wasn't like I was a household name in the UK. Yeah. There was a weird moment. I mean, one of my... Uh, if you can call them this, my, my HIV role models, was a guy called Nigel Wrench, who was a, a presenter on Radio 4, Radio 5, who came out about his HIV status a number of years before I did. And there was this wonderful moment where we both found ourselves. He was presenting News Hour, and I was reading the news, and it suddenly occurred to the two of us that we were broadcasting this show to the whole world, including portions of the world that would have very different views about us and what we represented had they known the truth, and that yeah. both the presenter and the newsreader were not only both gay, but both HIV positive. And that was a funny penny drop moment as yeah. well. Uh, but yeah, I did worry. I did worry about whether or not it would affect my bookability. Uh, mm. I wondered whether or not it would affect my work. Uh, fortunately, I had a gay boss at the BBC who was nothing other than supportive. Mm. And as is so often the case with these things, I'd made it into a much bigger perceived problem than it actually was ever going to be. Yes, because people who are listening to you on the radio... Actually, unless you, you come out with it on the radio and say, oh, by the way, I'm gay and I've got HIV, no one's going to care because yeah. they just want to hear the news. Probably wouldn't be appropriate in the context it, of a news probably... bulletin anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, you know, why would you, uh, why, why would you discuss anything that happens behind closed doors? Yeah, actually? exactly. Exactly. So it's not relevant to the listener in the first place. But, but yeah, we do. We, we all worry about these things. And I think it, it's come up a few times when um, in these chats that I've had with other VOs, we're all self-employed. So a lot of it is worry that, well, if I've got a condition, if I've got, if I've got HIV, or if I've got cancer or I've had a heart attack, I can't let people know because then I'm suddenly going to be considered to be vulnerable. Yeah. And I don't want that because I want to be able to work until... They carry me off in a box. Yeah, considered <laughs> you know? vulnerable, or in my case, you know, the, the the stigma that comes with having something like HIV being considered dirty, being considered infectious, or you know, any number of you can run any number of stories about something like this if you allow yourself to. You know, what if what if my potential clients talk to one another and discuss this? I mean, well, why would they? I mean, what would that make them look like? Um, exactly. But, but you don't think like that. It's an irrational fear. Of course, it is. In your personal life, in that period between you finding out that you're HIV positive and then finding yourself in a very happy, loving relationship, did you find it difficult to date or meet people yes. because of your status? Yeah, very hard, mm. um, which surprised me because I thought that the gay community had kind of moved on a little bit and I, I was very hurt and surprised when I found myself knocked back by people who were fine with dating me until they realised that I had HIV. I had one guy that I that I quite liked who um, was fine until he found that out, and then he said, well, I, you know, I have a son, and I worry about infecting him, so I can't see you. People are uneducated, Ellie, and that's the problem. They worry that they haven't done the research themselves. They don't know, so they worry about, well, you know, what, what about toothbrushes? What about mugs? Or what, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all about education. Yeah. I suppose so. And I guess, like anything else, if they are going to run a mile, then they're not worth being with no. anyway. Um, they were never the right person. And the thing is, when I met Mark, I met somebody who Mark had actually lost his partner just three months before to HIV. Wow. And it was the first person that he'd known die from HIV related things in about 10, 12, 14 years. But it turned out that Mark had had a number of partners who were HIV positive. Mark had remained HIV negative throughout and still is. And we ended up being part of a pan-European study. I don't know if you remember this, but you might have been aware a year or two ago, there was a news story where they finally uh, came to the conclusion that people who were on successful antiretroviral treatment it was impossible for them, even during unprotected sex, to pass on HIV to their partners. Oh. Uh, and that was a big thing that changed, finally changed a lot of people's attitudes, I think. And mm. it came about as a result of the study that we'd stayed in for eight years. We'd answer questionnaires and, and have our blood taken every few months. And they finally conclusively proved that, that across something like 3,000 couples that they'd tested across Europe over an eight-year period, they hadn't found one case 
of transmission from an HIV positive to an HIV negative partner where the positive partner was on successful treatment. And that changed everything. Wow. So it was nice to be able to be involved in that. Yeah. And, and doing your bit yeah. as well. Yeah. I do feel proud that I was able to be part of that, that groundbreaking research that, that has changed the map for people. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. So how did you meet Mark? (laughs) (laughs) That's the only time you sounded gay in this whole conversation. (laughs) Oh, so there's a gay sound, is there, Ellie? Well, maybe we should just unpack that. So I'd been in this... I was in a relationship for for six years with somebody that I I loved very much, but again, the relationship had kind of gone off course and there were there were fundamental things about it that weren't working Um, and we'd broken up and we got back together again and it wasn't really working and my ex is Australian and he'd announced uh, this would have been around like October 2009 he'd he'd announced that he was going to take a trip to go and see the family down under uh, and was I going to come in the following February so I said well why don't you do that and who knows maybe I'll I'll take a trip of my own and I did I took a trip. Um, I took my friend Julian Warwicker from the BBC, a great friend of mine. Oh, yeah, I um, know that name. Yeah. We went off to South Florida to Fort Lauderdale for, well, he came with me for a week and we had a great time and did the Everglades and went and checked out all the Art Deco in Miami and did all of that stuff. And mm. I built a few days on the end into this plan where after Julian returned to London, I was going to go off and explore and have a bit of fun on my own. Yeah. And so I'd been chatting online with this guy and I he was making me laugh and he got my humour. Mm. Um, but he'd also told me that his partner had just died and he absolutely wasn't in the frame for any kind of relationship and not even for hooking up or anything like that. And we'd carried on chatting and eventually he said, look, I, I, I said, look, I'm having real trouble finding the real Fort Lauderdale here. And he said, well, I'm a park ranger. I show tourists around all the time. Um, He said, if you want to meet for coffee and you don't drive me nuts and I don't feel like you're an axe murderer, then I'll take the weekend and I'll I'll show you Fort Lauderdale. So we agreed. I mean, the the driving nuts would come later, obviously. I've spent a career of that since. But we met (laughs) up and he almost didn't come into the coffee shop. And... He heard a voice that said, don't worry, you and this guy are going to be just fine. And that was what got him over the threshold. Mm. And I think within, probably within an hour, I think we both kind of knew that there was something going on here. And uh, we called each other by different names or, or felt a strong urge to call each other by different names for the first couple of days. It was like the the moment we met, it was like, ah, oh, you. And it was like we'd known each other before. I just, I just yeah. felt a really, really strong bond and did a lot of talking and a lot of crying, both of us. And then at the end of that first night, we'd gone for the hug and I put my head on his shoulder and our heads touched and it was like this moment in my... All of the talk stopped and everything went absolutely silent and I just had this this feeling of being connected and peaceful connected to infinity I said well he said what I said do you feel that and he said yeah and I think we we realized at that point that we had a real connection and I went home three days later and finally broke things off with my existing partner and said I think we're done here I've met somebody so I called Mark and he picked up the phone and with typical melodrama uh, I said it's done. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what's done? And I said, well, I've, bro- I've broken up with my partner. And, so you uh, did just break up with him. You didn't murder him. <laughs> so we've broken up. We, we've, we've agreed to put the house on the market. And I want to see what this might look like and give this a go. Wow. So uh, we did. We dated long distance for a few months. I went out to meet his his big Italian family in Massachusetts a couple of months later for Easter. Mm. And at the end of that trip, I said, so does this mean we're going steady? And he said, I guess so. I said, great. I really want you to come to London for the summer. And he said, I can't do that. 
I've got a job and I got a he got a really complicated living situation where he was living in a in, in an apartment that was his parents apartment but his father had died and his mother was going into care and they right. were having to sell his apartment that he lived in and it was 55 and over and the people in the in the complex were trying to get him out anyway so he had this thing that he knew that if he left it he wouldn't be able to get back in yeah. so he's like I have a job I have an apartment that I can't give up and I reckon I need when he sat and did the the math math maths you um, you've I live in America turned. now <laughs> I live in America now um he said I've wor- I've done the math and I've worked out that I need $10,000 to float and maintain my life in both places so that I can come back if it doesn't work out and I don't have $10,000 so I said okay um but you know it's 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 what I'd like he called me a few days later he said you'll never guess what um, I lost my job. They're, they're cutting back and they want to lay me off for the summer. And when I asked how long for, they said four months. <laughs> wow. I said, great, come to London. And he said, I can't. I still have this ridiculous living situation and they're trying to get me out of the apartment and uh, I can't give up the apartment and I still don't have $10,000. I said, okay, just do, sit with it. Mm. Uh, he called me the day or two days later and he said so the apartment was put on the market and I told my brother not to worry about it because nothing has sold in this in this complex in years this was like the the after the financial slump of 2008 yeah and they put the apartment on the market and it was sold within 24 hours wow um I said great come to London he said I can't he said apart from anything else I now need to find a new job and I need to find a new apartment and I still don't have $10,000. And I said, okay, well, you know, if it works, it works. And he put the phone down. He called me 20 minutes later. He said, you'll never guess what just happened. I said, go on. He said, I had a call from my lawyer. Not that it's really my lawyer. This is somebody I've never even dealt with before. But I did have an outstanding lawsuit. And I just got a call. And they said they want to settle and we advise you to take it. And I said, how much will I walk with? And he said, $10,000. Wow. I said, so what are you going to do? He said, I think the universe has been pretty clear at this point. I don't need a house to be dropped on me or anything like that. So uh, I guess I'm coming to London. So he came to London for the summer, in the summer of 2010. And uh, four months later, we were working out ways to keep him in the country. And... So at this point in the UK, we had civil partnerships, but we didn't have gay marriage yet. Right, OK. But he'd done some research and thought, well, what if we were to go back to Massachusetts and get married in Massachusetts? Mm. So we nipped off to, to get married with his family. He did a very small ceremony at his sister's house with his elderly mother, who, after we did the ceremony, called me over. Uh, to, um, I kneeled down next to her wheelchair and she said, she took my hand and she, she said, look me in the eye and promise me you'll take good care of my son. And I said, I promise, Sally. And then she, she looked straight at Mark. She said, and you, you take good care of him. He said, I, he said, I will, Ma, I promise. Um, and she, she passed away about eight, nine weeks later. So Mark got to stay in the UK. Finally, a couple of, a couple of years later than that, became a British citizen. Mm-hmm. And by that point, the law in the US had changed. So, so suddenly, I'd already gone past all the, the limitations for how long you needed to be married before you could go for a green card and all of that. So I went to the end of a very short line for, for immigration, for green cards, and I had a green card in three months. And we moved six months later, I think. Wonderful. And how did you find your place? <laughs> <laughs> so... When Mark was a park ranger in Fall, he's done he's done everything. I mean, he's mm. he's also an accomplished chef and and cooks the most amazing food. And he he, he has he's one of those people who has so many skills. Mm. I, I honestly don't know what I would do without him at this point. My life is a much better place with him in it. But yeah. he was a park ranger at the time I met him. And one of the things that they did at this park was they used to have a drum circle and still do, I think, on the solstice and the equinox. So all of these, they'd have like three, four, five, six, seven hundred people turn up for this thing. And the hippies were coming up to him and saying, hey, dude, you're just an old hippie in a young man's body, man. You need to get yourself to Asheville and hang out with the hippies there. Um, And this had happened enough times by this point that he'd said, what about Asheville? And I'd said, well, 
interesting words, but I don't know anything about that. He said, look, mm. it's it sounds really cool and it seems to be making a lot of these lists of best places to dot, dot, dot. Yes. Check it out and see what you think. And I checked it out and it looked really cool. So it went to the top of our list of places that we were going to go and check out that we might want to live in. And isn't that great to just have a clear map? Yeah. Um, you know, and as long as as long as you're allowed in, you can live wherever you want. Yeah, I mean, we had a few places on there. We had Savannah, Georgia. We had um, San Diego. We had Sedona, Arizona. But Asheville was the first place that we came and we checked it out and we spent a few days here. We had some reservations about leaving London, which at the time we certainly thought of as being the most forward-thinking, most progressive city on the planet yeah. and whether or not we wanted to move to the Bible Belt. Because mm -hmm. uh, this really is the Bible Belt. I mean, we live here surrounded by uh, Republicans and there there are Trump supporter signs all along the highway. Although Asheville itself is very progressive and very liberal and, and it's kind of this shining blue beacon in the sea of red. But we wow. still had some reservations about it. And you don't have to go far out of Asheville, as I say. I mean, we're 15 miles out of town and we live surrounded by uh, by very right-wing people. Um, we all rub along okay, but we didn't know that at the time. And it was on the Sunday. We were, we were sitting outside a bar in downtown Asheville and we were mulling this very point about whether or not we wanted to move to the Bible Belt. And right on cue comes a man, and it's obviously a man because he's got a thick beard, dressed as a nun running down the middle of the street, pulling up his habit so that he can run and he's not tripping over it, right down the middle of the, tr of the street. And people are cheering him on. And I looked at Mark and he looked at me and we both looked at the nun. And, um, <laughs> and Mark turned to me and he said, well, I have no fucking clue what that is all about. But the idea that you can get away with doing that here on a Sunday probably means you and I are going to be okay. And we later found out that the, the, the nun, she's called Sister Bad Habit. Okay. <laughs> so Sister Bad Habit was instrumental and was the, the thing that sealed our fate in terms of moving to Asheville. Wonderful. <laughs> and how do you fill your day now? My American life does not look anything like I expected it to, Ellie. I, I did not see myself... When I left London I, um, and we talked about living in America, I kind of thought we would be downtown or at least downtown adjacent, you know. I did not see myself living out in the mountains in a log cabin and with a couple of pet goats, uh, which you'll find on my, my Instagram. They're the cutest thing. We have a bunch <laughs> of chickens. We have a couple of pet goats and a couple of rescue dogs who we brought with us from London who think this is the best place ever, uh, having been crammed into 900 square feet in the middle of London. Uh, to go from, from living in a terraced ex-council house in Walworth, SE17, to living in a log cabin in the Blue Ridge Mountains with just under 19 acres, most of which is the side of a mountain, uh, you know, with a creek and a covered bridge and later some goats and some chickens. I, I just hang out here and I, I, I look out at the mountain and I do the work that comes in and I, I hope I'm doing a good job and hope that people want to keep paying me to talk. When I was diagnosed... Although it was a, an awful thing and I felt like the, the, the bottom had just dropped out of my world. Unfortunate mm. turn of phrase. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I, I kind of thought, it was like, wow, well, this is going to change everything forever. But mm. the thing was, even with that, I, I had a, a really deep sense of knowing at that point that this wasn't going to be the thing that killed me. And I think knowing that... If you if you have that kind of deep knowing, you don't know where it comes from, but anything on top of that is really anything that you create. It's a story that you create. So I guess at some point I realised I could write another story about it. I would never have seen my life trajectory, my career trajectory. Uh, I'm not going to say that word again because I think three <laughs> times probably a, probably it's quite a stress. Hard word as well. <laughs> I talk for a living. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, my life doesn't look anything like I expected it to. But you know what? I love it. I love it. I've got great people around me and great friendships. So we are where we are and I'm, I couldn't be happier with it. You've been listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton and Mike Cooper with music from Beats Bakery. This podcast was produced by Carl Spenson from Tadar Media. 
If you've been enjoying this series of Tales from the Tannoy, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.